This is an interview with David Van Zandt, Dean and Professor of Law at Northwestern University School of Law. Uh, David, uh, we're very happy to have you come today and also to talk about both the history of the law school and Dean uh, John Henry Wigmore, your mm -hmm. predecessor, mm -hmm. and his role at the law school. And perhaps we can start by talking a bit about that. Well, first of all, I think I should point out I didn't know him personally, so in case <laughs> anybody uh, has a misconception right. about that. Um, but it's, it's actually difficult being a dean at a law school with a predecessor such as John Henry Wigmore. He was, um, by all accounts, a, a tremendous leader, and um, he did so many different things, and we're going to talk about one aspect of what he did, but he really built Northwestern Law School up to something, uh, to a national law school from, frankly, probably a more local or regional uh, school during his time at Dean, and he was able to attract very good faculty, uh, excellent students, um, and he uh, he was a real leader. It's hard to hard to walk in his footsteps. Well, though, when he came in 1893 as a professor to Northwestern Law, mm -hmm. it was considered a very good appointment. His uh, colleagues at Harvard are telling mm -hmm. him this is right. very good. He right. should come and so on, uh, and and he considers it a good appointment too. Sure. So um, he's pleased to be here. And Chicago is a thriving place. Of course, that's the year that Altgeld pardons the anarchists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a great deal going on in Chicago. But it's a very lively legal community. Yeah, yeah. It's a business center. It's an economic mm -hmm. center. It's growing very fast. Right. So he's coming to a place which is very vibrant and has an institution which is ready yeah. to take off. Yes, yes. And I, I suppose that was one of the big attractions for him. He, he had a chance to build something because yeah. if you look back on his career, he certainly uh, just built things. And he, yes. you know, he started and brought things uh, and built them up over time. And, and, uh, well, one of the unusual things about him is by the time he came to Northwestern, he had already spent time in Japan. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he had a perspective of a world that was much larger than one yeah, particular right. place. Yeah. And his interest in comparative law, I think, was very unusual right. at the time. Right. That's right. And uh, he actually wrote quite a bit about that. And also his fact that he was so prolific as an author. Yes. Uh, yeah. It was quite uh, noteworthy and yes. unusual at the time, and a really important aspect of his leadership, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's quite striking, um, the two things you've mentioned. I think he was you know, pretty much alone in American legal education in bringing in um, the, the international um, aspects of law. And you know, a lot of the work today we might look back on as being sort of, you know, interesting but not particularly useful. On the other hand, it was what he did was he traveled constantly. He brought the American legal education to other parts of the world right. and other, other places in the world that, that attribute um, you know, their education system to what he had done. And we're still seeing today the ramifications of that in places like Japan and Korea right now where they're you know, falling through more on the American model than they ever had in the past. And indeed, the Northwestern School of Law at the present time has programs abroad. Yes, right. Tell us a little bit about those. Well, you know, our, our belief at Northwestern is that there's really two very significant areas um, for, for global, that, that a law school should be involved in globally. And one is, is in international human rights. And I think if we look around us, um, you see that that's played a much bigger role than just 20 years ago in what happens in the world. And, and our prediction is it'll keep going that way. We have an International Human Rights Center led by um, Professor Doug Castle. Uh, it does tremendous work in that area. Uh, the other big area, and this is a little more, uh, little more uh, ubiquitous or general, is generally we think that a lot of the developments in international law and international activity will be in the private area, so the commercial area. Um, uh, where you will see, I mean, because the world is getting smaller and smaller ec economically, so we've devoted quite a bit of attention to that, doing things such as exposing our students to, to those programs. Our international team project course sends groups of 25 students to individual countries uh, in the spring semester where they, they do field research and interview people working in the legal system of that of that country. Um, in point of fact, Wigmore would have been very interested in and uh, approving yes. of the kinds of international programs we have now. Tell us a little bit about some of those. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we really have focused on two discrete areas in the international, uh, in the inter international law world. One is on international human rights. 
Um, it includes criminal law, uh, you know, cross-border criminal prosecutions and defend, uh, you know, representing defendants. Um, our International Human Rights Center, which is led by Professor Doug Castle, does a tremendous job in that area. And I think you can see around us that, um, uh, particularly in the last 20 years, there's really been an emerging sense of international norms that have some bite to them. Whereas, you know, if, I, if we go back 20 or 30 or 40 years, I think it was more talk than it was any, anything else. So we think that's a very important area. And the other big area that we see and where we try to push our students is in the general commercial area, international commercial area. As economies become more and more globalized and come together, that's where people really need the help around the world, whether it's, it's having a legal order that allows business to take place, um, uh, just equipping our students to be effective in those, uh, in those environments. And we do that in a number of ways. And we off certainly offer extern uh, exchange um, opportunities for students out of law schools. But probably more important is that we do something called international team projects. Uh, they are courses offered in the second semester each year. Our students gather in groups of up to 25 with a faculty member, pick a country to study. Uh, they divide into teams and, and they do some preliminary study at the law school, but then during our, our uh, two-week spring, uh, spring break, they go off to that country and do interviews and, and put together the, the results of their, of their research. So they're really becoming part of an international uh, community of lawyers exactly. who share a common education right. and background and norms, hopefully, yep. and, who, the st and who are a very important part of preserving right. the stability of an international legal order. Right. Uh, people who start from the same place that's and, and part right. of that of course is we also have uh, a, a significant number of lawyers from abroad who come and participate right. in our LLM program right. yeah. uh, from all over the all over the world right. from uh, Latin America right. and, and Asia and um, right. Europe and so on and these are all developments that Wigmore I think would have been very happy with I think would have, you know in his time the number of lawyers or people generally who had a real international perspective was probably much smaller. Much uh, smaller. Than, much smaller than it is today. And in part, it only makes sense because whether it was economic activity or social activity was yeah. much more local and regional. And, um, but the trend has been very much towards a more globalizing, with all its pluses and minuses, and culturally and otherwise. Exactly. Um, uh, and I think he would be, be very proud of his school sort of responding to those, to those changes. Well, during his period as dean, in fact, this school became very prominent in the country, yes. uh, didn't it? Yes. And was right. even ranked very high, Highly, and, yeah. and uh, yeah. that was a, a very famous time. Now, you know, the founding of the Journal of Criminal Law and mm -hmm. Criminology and the founding of the American Institute of Criminal Law and Cr Criminology was also an international event. Not only yeah. was it a national event, but at that time, my understanding is just from reading the historical papers is that criminology was dominated by Italian and German hmm. commentators and so bringing them to this Na American Institute was a really signal event and yeah, of course yeah. we forget but legal education was dominated by German Germans, yeah. education right. and and you see you still see the ramifications of that so yeah. when that first conference was held in 1911 at the Northwestern Law School that at the, when the journal was founded the journal which yes. is still published today yeah, that yeah, was really right. a very significant yeah. gathering of people. Yeah. I also think it was not only significant at the time but it represented Wigmore's foresight as to where Correct. the world would, would head. I mean he, he, there's a couple of respects now you've pointed out one which is the international side of that um, of that effort. Uh, there's another uh, uh, respect in which he was very much ahead of his time. I mean, he, um, uh, through that conference, he tried to bring together both lawyers and criminologists, people studying crime, in, in really sort of a cross-disciplinary approach that uh, today marks what we do at the law school. Uh, and I think he was really ahead of his time. Lawyers tend to like to yes. hang out with themselves yes. and uh, uh, other social scientists don't, um, uh, don't necessarily interact as much with them. And I think Wigmore was way ahead of his time in doing that. The last part of that is a lot of that, you know, his focus on putting criminology and lawyers, criminologists and lawyers together, really, I think, was um, maybe not the start, but certainly an important push in the trend at looking at criminal law and criminal procedure from a more scientific or at least uh, evidence-based evidence -based approach um, that led to things like the, the founding of the, the, the 
crime lab uh, under Professor Fred Inbell at the law school. And I think it was 1938 um, that was finally, uh, it may have been a little earlier, that was founded at the law school. And, uh, you know, that, I think, for all of its problems, led to, to major steps forward in, in criminal practice and criminal procedure and the solving of crimes. Well, also, um, the American Institute and the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology, yeah. which was was called the Journal of the American Institute of Criminal Law and Criminology at that time. They shortened it a little bit later. But from its outset, it had sociologists, psychologists, yeah. yeah. non-lawyers on the editorial board, and, and right. the founders felt that right. was very important. In fact, the first uh, editor-in-chief uh, was not a lawyer, was a psychologist right. from Northwestern University. So that commitment to interdisciplinary work, as you say, was very unusual at the time. And, but also, of course, it was a very unusual time in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You have the progressives, and you have an mm -hmm. interest in sociology and history and, right. quote, reform right. in 1911, which continues right, right on up through yeah. uh, the 20s. Um, and, and again, Chicago is a lab for right. juvenile uh, working in people working in the juvenile courts, right. That's right. for uh, what we would now call sociological research. Right. Uh, the city was seen as a great laboratory right. for right. this kind of work. Right. The founding of the juvenile court yep. continued mm -hmm. that. The mm -hmm. crime reports, the city co commission reports in 1911, 1915, and then of course the very important 1929 Illinois Crime mm -hmm. Survey mm -hmm. for which Wigmore was the editor. Again, mm -hmm. another example of his right. leadership. Right. And that, that branches into another part of his career, which, which is that he was very dedicated to finding answers to social problems, or at least uh, to help with social problems. And so he took the law school and really extended its reach out into the Chicago community, if not the national community. Now, yes. Chicago is a great place to do it. I mean, Chicago is sort of the the home of modern sociology in many ways. I'm a, I'm a sociologist myself, and you know, we certainly still read about the demography studies that were done and, and the way people approached um, the, the changing immigration patterns in, in Chicago. But Wigmore was part of that, and you can see, you can see um, uh, uh, his contribution to that. You can, and you know, for the Illinois Crime Survey, which is today a monument to sociological and criminological mm -hmm. study, I mean, when you read that crime survey, which was done in first started in 1926, published in 1929 as a tribute to Wigmore and that distinguished mm -hmm. board, that they didn't sit on it after the reform mayor who appointed those people was kicked out and somebody who wasn't so reform-minded came mm -hmm. in. But, you know, they just couldn't get rid of that board. It was right. every distinguished right. person in criminal law in Chicago and the country. They just couldn't scotch it. And of course, a modern day example of that is the Governor's Commission on Capital Punishment. That's right. That's right. You know, I think um, uh, Wigmore would have been very proud of that as well. He so. would have been very proud of that. And it continues the tradition of very serious academic research yes. applied to a very practical right. problem right. with rigor and intellectual discipline. Right. And that's something I think the law school still benefits from that from that legacy that Wigmore left with our various clinics and centers at the law school that our, our mission is really to reach out in the community in many different areas and try to help reform it as well as educate our educate our students. And of course our students benefit from this aspect of the law school's role yeah. in the community right. and also we hope uh, inculcate the values right. of careers which have a public and private dimension mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. maybe you want to talk a little bit about that too. Yeah I think the image of a law school legal education that that, that Wigmore developed is precisely that I mean certainly there is um, there's a lot of legal education that's technical in the sense of learning the basics about reading cases and, and analyzing um, uh, writing and analyzing issues uh, that's sort of the core of what you do in law school but what Northwestern has always tried to do is put that into a, the broader context of what you're going to do with that uh, in the community in the wider uh, in the wider nation and I think that to me is sort of in many ways if you is a secret of even American legal education that is it's much more it recognizes laws applied it's not a uh, hermetically sealed discipline um, from everything else it's uh, applied to real problems that people have, um, whether they're personal or, or, or you know, business problems that they might have out there in the world. And uh, you know, I think, particularly at Northwestern, we understand that. Um, 
Uh, I'd like to see all of our students in the second and third year be outside the doors as much as possible and to, to, um, and to, to either be working uh, uh, for a government agency or something uh, so that they can gain more of the experience, what it's really like to apply their strong analytic skills to, to that environment. Right, and of course the connection between uh, lawyers, legal education, and politics and yeah. political roles has always been very strong. It has been very strong, right. And right. Uh, we see that during the 1870s to 1930 period, but it also continues right on. Right. Of course, the office of the state's attorney has often been a path to being governor sure. or center, yeah. uh, senator or sometimes even president. And so the criminal law and the criminal courts have been an right. avenue for that kind right. of progress. Yeah, and I don't know if that was Wigmore's original idea, but certainly mm -hmm. that played out over time that as our students were interested in criminal law and, and went to state's attorney's offices or went to the U.S. attorney's office um, or worked on the, on the defense side, at least starting out, they tended to be in a position of, of uh, uh, where, where they would have a political path um, to follow down the road. So a lot of our, um, a lot of our Illinois elected officials um, have Northwestern law connections, ranging from Don Clark Netch, um, who has been on our faculty, to um, Jim Thompson, the former mm -hmm. governor, um, a number of judges on the current federal court, uh, uh, as well as some prior chief judges of the Cook County uh, Court have been all been Northwestern right. law grads. Right. Um, but of course, legal education was very different in Wigmore's time yes, yeah. than it is now. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it's funny. In some ways, it was very, it was very different. In some ways, it's still the same. Because uh -huh. um, we can go into Lincoln Hall, which was uh, uh, one of, uh, by the way, one of Wigmore's other accomplishments was to build the law school at its right. current site. Right. Um, it used to be in a downtown office building. Yes, we have a nice picture of that on the, on the website. Good, good. It was like right on Michigan Avenue yeah, or something, right? It was a right? lake in, was it lake in? Yeah. It wasn't Michigan, it was further, it was mm -hmm. further um, west, but. Um, it was an, in an office building. Yeah, it was just an office building, and, and that's the way a lot of uh, law schools were created back in the mid part of the, um, of the 1800s. Um, what he did was he actually built the current Levy Mayor building, uh -huh. uh, and um, the, the story told about that is that when the building was finally completed, he organized a parade <laughs> with music that right. marched the students, the faculty, and the staff uh, right. from the downtown location right. up to the Chicago Avenue location. Well, I think that's, uh, that's such a typical kind of Wigmore story right. in that uh, he was clearly very charismatic, very idiosyncratic, mm -hmm. loved music, mm -hmm. loved, loved music. art, right, art. Mm -hmm. um, was the kind of person who attracted other people to yeah. him and was very much always like organizing other people to do things, That's right? right? right. right. So that, that sounds like just such, like such a typical uh, Wigmore story. You well, know, you mentioned one part of it too, was the art. The art, you know, you know, one, yes. <laughs> Our building is yes. full of art. Um, um, drawings, art. paintings yeah. that Wigmore collected. Now, uh, uh, the story again about what he did was during the summers, um, mm -hmm. he, he and his wife um, would travel um, around the world um, doing all his different things, but also one of their missions was to collect artwork for, for the law school. So we have a tremendous collection on the halls. In fact, a lot of our collection, we don't have enough space to, yeah. to display it all. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's up here in the, um, in the block gallery, at least in the storage for that. So, and uh, it's also art particularly art which pictures or describes or in some, some way represents courts, courts yeah. or adjudicatory proceedings. Right. So, and a number of right. those uh, paintings and drawings are on the yeah. walls of the law school. It ranges from, you know, some serious portraits of, yeah. of, of, of former you know, judges from the past to sort of uh, uh, newspaper cartoons right. about law and, right. and lawyers. And of course, newspaper cartoons about law and lawyers have a long and wonderful, yes. rich history. Yeah. It's in, not just in Chicago, but especially in Chicago, continuing right to the present. I mean, nothing, it, no, no subjects are more s <laughs> given to being well, ridiculed than courts and judges. And well, the great thing about our profession, in both the plus and the minus, is that everybody focuses on what we do. So when we <laughs> do things true. well, you know, it's fine, and we make mistakes or or don't do things well, we also right. hear about it too. Right. So. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the legal community in Wigmore's day yeah. and now. So yes. The sense we get, at least from looking at the history of the 1911, 19, 
18 period, uh, even during the 20s, is that if you were part of the elite, you knew everybody in yes. Chicago and even throughout the country yeah. who was important in the field of law. And, and leaders were leaders for the whole country. Right. Uh, talk a little bit about how that's changed or not changed. Yeah, I, you know, I think I, uh, one big difference um, uh, is that just the numbers of lawyers yeah. are greater. Yeah. Uh, you know, every state produces a certain number of lawyers. They have bar exams that, that put people in. Uh, into law positions. So I think just the size of the national legal community has gotten much bigger. It's also law has gotten far more specialized. Again, uh, you know, in Wigmore's time, the, the, the faculty of the law school probably was 10 to 20 at most faculty members, and they all did sort of the same thing. They would teach different courses, but they all knew uh, in pretty good detail what, what um, the different subjects were, and that's changed a lot because law has become far more specialized over time. Um, Part more of technical. That, the more technical part of that is due, you know, we have many more um, state and federal statutes yeah. in yeah. different areas regulating yeah. things. Uh, right. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's, it's natural, it's just gotten more complex uh, over right. time. So it's harder for there to be sort of an elite cadre of great lawyers. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, there's a small number of people today that you would think of who are, are tremendous um, trial lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and then there's there's and then there's certainly other lawyers who are pillars of their community, um, but it's hard to think of a, a, a small and cohesive group the way it existed in, in Wigmore's time of the entire profession. And you know for that reason, whether it's specialization, size, the profession is more fragmented. I think the yes. American Bar Association played a much bigger role in the in the legal community back in the. In the last part of the 18th, 1800s and, and into the, the beginning of the um, uh, 20th century, um, and I think you know it's 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 still a very important organization, uh, but it doesn't have the kind of presence that that it used to have. It's true. It is it, the sheer numbers do make a difference. Yeah. Um, and the assumption certainly was that if you were a lawyer, you were competent to do anything. anything no. um, so the specialization wasn't there. Maybe perhaps courts didn't intrude in people's lives, every yes. aspect of people's lives yeah. the way they do now. Oh, I think just if you look at the, stat the size of the statute books, um, yeah. uh, and, and the courts I think are really trail that, but uh, the government does tend to regulate a lot more in different areas yeah. um, uh, than it ever did. So, I mean, there's also a question of access to justice, and, uh, legal services. Uh, Northwestern, I think, has always been uh, an organization or, or a law school that's tried to emphasize increased access to legal help. But if you go back to Wigmore's time, there are very few people really using the court system. Um, yeah. I mean, they may get caught in sure. you know, criminal prosecution sure. or something, but the, the volume of cases was tiny compared to what it is yes. today in the state and federal courts. And of course, um, that in many ways made the criminal law more important, yeah. a bigger part of the law right. Right. than now, perhaps. Well, I think if you look at the cases that are in state and federal courts now, criminal law <laughs> dominates more than they ever have in the past. But mm. I think, you know, my, my, my sense was there are far more sort of uh, dis contract dispute cases, uh, uh, property cases back uh, is a proportion of the total cases. Uh -huh. On the other hand, I think the criminal stuff has become so routine today because of statute sentencing mm -hmm. guidelines, uh -huh. statute sentencing guidelines and that kind of thing. Um, that uh, while there are st some, still some very creative and interesting lawyering going on yes. in that area, a lot of it has become very routine. Um, yeah, that was a very interesting comment. Um, uh, I, it seems to be the institutional trend seems to have been to increasingly narrow discretion, discretion in, right. in the area of right. criminal law. That's right. That's um, right. And it's true, it's, it's, it is much more routinized, much yeah. more routinized, and it's become a very efficient, yeah. in some ways, bureaucratic yeah, machine, for better or for worse. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure there's, I mean, I think with the increasing number of people involved and the increasing um, flow of, of criminal cases mm -hmm. because there's more regulation out there, uh, I'm not sure there's uh, an ideal answer to that problem. I mean, and you had many more judges who had a lot more discretion. So the, yeah. the, the legislators yeah. looked at that and said that's not a good thing when yeah. somebody in, you know, one doing the same thing gets a very different sentence than someone yeah. uh, in another location. What about um, if we look at Wigmore's time and we look at particularly something like the Illinois Crime Survey yeah. 
And uh, my sense is, again, from a long perspective, that they could, that Wig, Wigmore and the people on that survey could not be gainsaid. You just couldn't tell them to go away. Yeah, yeah. And that was an aspect of Wigmore's leadership. And what about today? Do you think that the legal community, especially the legal academic community, has that kind of power or authority? I, I, don't, think so. I don't think they do. And again, I think it comes from the real just change and you know, mm -hmm. development of society from a small group of elites, whether they are lawyers or whoever they were, mm -hmm. who had a big say in just about everything, to today yeah. when it's, just, it's much more diffuse authority within a community or, or a society. There's another factor there, which uh, Wigmore, in a sense, is responsible for, at mm -hmm. least on the academic law side. Uh, we talked before about um, you know, him introducing uh, cross-disciplinary or, or interdisciplinary kinds yeah. of studies. Right. Um, lawyers or, or legal academics, like everyone else, has become more specialized over, uh, over time. Uh, yeah. They only know a certain area uh, really well. Um, they don't know everything well. And so they're, they're less attractive as spokespeople or mm -hmm. uh, platonic guardians for, mm -hmm. uh, for society. Not to say that they're, they, they probably get a disproportionate um, exposure that way, but uh, uh, there are fewer of them doing that. Some because they're focusing on their academic specialty, um, but also in part because uh, they don't have sort of the overall perspective that, that the people in Wig the elite in Wigmore's time had. That's true. And of course, it's partly a question of changes in socioeconomic status mm -hmm. of lawyers. Right where to be a lawyer or a law professor at Wigmore's time puts you at the very top of the right. social right. and economic pyramid. Yeah. And it still would today, but yeah. there'd be many more people up there yeah. with you in other professions, so yeah. it wouldn't be quite so Yeah, different. I think, you know, I sort of, I look, it's a big trend I see is the, the decreasing professionalization of legal services um, and a number of different things that follow from that. Well, what do you mean exactly by that? Well, because as you pointed out, when um, 100 years ago, um, a lawyer was perceived to be a, a professional with mm -hmm. a special training. Yeah. It sort of grows out of the old guild system. Yes. You know, uh, uh, like the, the horseshoe or the blacksmith knew how to put horseshoes. You know, right. And, and they sort of controlled the market for that. Lawyers had very good control over their market because then they were very well trained. Um, uh, and for years, they had more power in the in the yeah. marketplace for legal services. So you know, you really had to pay the fixed fee that lawyers agreed to among themselves if you wanted legal services. Uh, uh, you didn't do a lot of shopping around for lawyers. Right. Um, you basically shut up and took the lawyer's advice. Yes. And we we see it's a parallel in the medical profession too. I like yeah. to compare those two all the time. The medical profession has gone through the same changes. What's happened today in both law and medicine is. The consumers of those services have mm -hmm. gotten far more sophisticated, uh, and the consumers have far more power in both those areas than they did, you know, uh, just a generation ago. And th th what that does, it, it 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 does make actually being a big lawyer in town less of a status, uh, a yes, high status. Yes, it's thing. true. The consumers are in the act. Also, other economic actors are very much in there influencing the role of the professionals. Right. Um, you know, big firms That's and, right. and, That's and right. other economic actors. So one of the things that happens, has happened, I think, is that certain aspects of economic life and private life have been taken away from the courts, you know. So you have this whole realm where private, courts used to right. decide things, which they don't anymore, yeah, yeah. which is a very complicated and interesting yeah. phenomenon. Yeah. Maybe you want to comment a bit yeah, about the, that. Yeah, the, the, well, part of it is by necessity. Um, today, as I mentioned before, I think it's 95 percent of all the cases um, tried in federal court are criminal. Yes, yes, it's uh, astonishing, astonishing figure. Astonishing number. Astonishing uh, figure. And so people with commercial disputes yeah. of all sorts of different kinds can't get access because of speedy trial rules. The, um, the Constitution itself requires yeah. you don't sort of keep somebody locked up for long periods of time without a trial. Uh, and so uh, there's just a shortage of available court resources to resolve some of these right. private commercial disputes. And what parties have done is started to use arbitrators, arbitration. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there are other reasons, too, because they have different rules. Um, yeah. uh, sometimes customers or clients feel that they're less expensive to use those. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I don't see this, some people see this as a very negative development. I don't see this particularly 
good or bad. I think it's just uh, a, a response to the changing environment that um, you see more litigation or more disputes being resolved uh, yes. privately. Yeah. In fact, I'm all in favor of private resolution of disputes. If, yeah. I mean, if it can be done to everyone's done. satisfaction. Right. Well, I, it's an interesting institutional corrective. I yeah. mean, if the courts are perceived as too bureaucratized, as right. taking too much time, as being too expensive, right. as not being either efficient or fair, fair or right. just right. adjudicators, then people or the society as a whole will look to okay. other adjudicators. Right. Right. So it's a commentary on our courts. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I would say that there's some nirvana of, of court-provided dispute resolution. I actually think it's the, the proper, the optimal mix is a mix. Mm -hmm. um, because I, mean, I think you probably always need to have the courts in the background. So if everything else fails in your dispute resolution, yeah. you right. can finally get a judgment about a, a dispute. On the other hand, I don't think everything should run through the court system. Mm -hmm. I, I would hope people could resolve disputes, whether it's by, in throughout history they've done, whether yeah. it's you know uh, between themselves using an, right. an intermediary in the community. It could have at one time could have been a, a, a someone in the religious establishment. Yes, um, that still than, is in yeah. lots of parts of the world. Right, it still is in lots of parts of the world. Like if you compare our system mm -hmm. to other even developed country systems, there you know we do resort to court probably a lot more. Um, we have more lawyers. We resort to actual formal court right. processes a lot more. Now, there's, there's positives and negatives of that. There's, Correct. You know, it's, it's a very expensive way to do things. The taxpayer pays for it. Right. Um, on the other hand, you do tend to get impartial, and you, you can have a claim adjudicated. Um, um, if you wait long enough, you can have a claim adjudicated. There's countries where you know, only the very wealthy can use the court system, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, most claims are not even justiciable in court. Yes, uh, or don't don't even get into court. Don't ever get into court, and so you know, the parties are left with whatever informal mechanisms there are for re resolving disputes, or with know, nothing. With nothing. Right? With nothing. Yes, right. it, again, it's a very interesting phenomenon yeah. uh, to observe, and anybody who's traveled and has yeah. seen courts in other parts of right. the world. Right. Um, has has observed this, uh, and of course, in Wigmore's time, it wouldn't have been that the courts were so dominant in our public life. That would have been no. one difference. Yeah. Although they played, uh, but talk some more about. I think they played a bigger, sim you know. I, I don't know about that. I, I think uh, at least judges, like the justices yeah. of the Supreme Court, and yeah. judges uh, judges in the state courts throughout the country, probably were bigger public citizens. Than they yeah. are today. Now, our Supreme Court still are, are celebrities in some respects. Although, I, I've always heard stories about justices walking around the court and not being recognized by people. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, my sense is that the, the legal establishment, particularly the judges, but other lawyers as well, were more relatively prominent within their communities um, than they are today. Let's, let's, I'd like to hear you comment some more about changing status, yeah, the changing yeah. standards of professionalism. Yeah and uh, the changing nature of the profession, but also people's norms of professionalism. Yeah. Well, you know, there are a lot, the, the word professionalism covers a whole range of different um, phenomena or events. They are, um, uh, in one part of it is what I was saying, that there's a, you know, it used to be, I mean, you became a lawyer not only because you get a higher sort of, you know, a, a upper middle class kind of income, but also yes. because it's a very high status thing. Correct. Everybody's mother wanted them to be a lawyer, like every mother's want to hope their son to be a or daughter be a doctor, um, right. and so I think there's been a decl relative decline in that part of, of being a lawyer. Um, now, I run into to, to many alums and others um, who were uh, trained in, in probably an earlier generation or the bridge generation between Wigmore and what we have today, and. There is a lot of talk about the mm -hmm. loss of the other part of professionalism, which is civility. Yes. Um, uh, ethics on the part of yes. the lawyers. Um, uh, here's where I'm a bit heretical, because I'm not sure that the actual moral fiber of our population has declined in any way. I do think there's probably less civility, but there's less civility throughout all of society. Exactly. Right? Um, I don't think it's peculiar to yeah, lawyers. It's not peculiar yeah. to lawyers. There's also the phenomenon in, ter in terms of c civility that you know, it used to be in, the, in, in a generation ago, you would practice law very much in your local jurisdiction and region. And everyone knew each other. And everybody knew each other. So the cost of being sort of nasty 
uh -huh. or, or unethical was yes. much higher. And so I do think you, you, now you have lawyers coming in from all over the country to, to appear in courts in Chicago, uh, and likewise in other sort of urban yes. areas around the country. And there's, right. there's more of a tendency, well, I can get away with it um, yeah. uh, uh, more here because I don't know these people and they're not going to they're not going to see me again. So. Yes, well, certainly the notion of the legal community being this small community where you live yes. and work and you see the same, pe same people every day is very right. important to that aspect of professionalism. Of course, when Wigmore came to Northwestern in 1893, that was a major trip. You didn't just yeah, like hop on a plane and go back to Boston or New York yeah, or yeah. get on the phone all the time yeah, or be yeah. in constant contact with the through the internet with your old friends and colleagues. I mean, I always think of John Peter Alkeld coming on the train with, I think, $5 or something in his pocket, and he sit, someone sits next to him on the train and says, where are you going? And he says, well, uh, I'm gonna come to Chicago and I think I wanna practice law. And the person who says, he says, well, do you have any place to go? And Alkeld says, no, and he doesn't have any place to stay. And so the person says, well, you know, you can have, I'll give you a desk in my office. Uh -huh. And so yeah, yeah. he comes there and he right. studies law eventually, right. of course. So it was a much smaller community and, yeah. and, and you knew people, but I think it's still true in, in outside of the urban areas of the United States. I think, you know, small towns, and I grew up in a reasonably smaller town. That, you know, certainly the, every, the lawyers knew everybody, the judges knew everybody. Yeah. And I think if we go back to the civility question, there probably was a higher level, or is a higher level of civility in that kind of thing, uh, in that kind of environment. Although, you know, memory plays tricks too. Sure. Right. Well, it's always good. It's always good that, you know, a few years, better a few years ago. So. Yes, the, the distant past is distant. always golden. <laughs> <laughs> it's always golden. But, you know, in terms of leadership in the legal community, um, institutions like the uh, Center um, on Wrongful Convictions yeah. and mm. the International Human Rights Center, I mean, they do set, set yeah. a standard right. for the community. Right. Yeah, and I think those efforts, I mean, there's still room for that kind of thing. I mean, leadership, and it can come. Uh, from other organizations, mm -hmm. but I think law school is in a particularly good central uh, position to have leadership on those issues, and we do have an effect. But I think the difference today is it's more less than being the dean being, um, you know, uh, someone who's constantly talking with the mayor about civic affairs, <laughs> which uh, I don't do. Um, uh, you know, it's more an individual project or cause or issue. Yeah that where, where law schools tend to have more of an effect. In, but that, that's true throughout our society, that it's, you know, it's more, you see much more issue, you know, issue yes. specific kinds of organizations um, uh, that have a bigger impact. Well, what about, for example, if you see a big political issue like, for example, um, tort reform, so-called yeah. tort reform in the right. states, uh, do you think the law schools play a major role in that politically? Actually, I've been quite disappointed. Mm -hmm. in, like, just to take tort, the tort mm -hmm. debate, you know, do we have the right substantive rules? Do we uh -huh. have the right procedure? Um, do we have the right system? Yes. Um, I've been quite disappointed in, in not seeing uh, academics and in, in law schools do more research on this and, and contribute more to it. Um, and it's really been turned over. And again, this is another, by the way, this is another phenomenon that's happened in the legal profession. Um, a lot of these issues are really turned back to the practicing lawyers and uh, uh, to make the arguments. And you know, we have tremendous uh, set of lawyers in this country who are very capable. Um, but in, the, for example, in the tort area, uh, there's not a whole lot of good research yeah. know, on about what the the consequences of different rules or reforms might be. Which is what you really need for a rational policy discussion of do we have the right system. It's really turned over to politics now and. Each side has their lawyers yeah. who make yeah. good arguments uh, about it, but I, I don't. I'm actually disappointed in both law schools and academic institutions. We have a couple of very young faculty who are actually finally doing some of this research. And the American Bar Foundation has been a leader in this area, yeah. haven't they? Yeah, and yeah. they've tried to do some research in this particular area mm -hmm. as well. Um, but but we sort of stand out as uh, yeah. you know uh, unusual in the world. Well, and similarly, I think it, there are a number of questions concerning criminal law okay. and election law reform right. Right. and so on, where you would hope that yeah, you get, you know, I think there in, would you be know, leadership shown. Criminal law, you get a little more mm -hmm. um, leadership. Uh, you know, for example, some members of the Sentencing Commission were, were law professors. Certainly, um, our work uh, through Larry Marshall in the, in the Center of Wrongful Convictions has had a big law, uh, uh, criminal law reform. 
uh, thing. I think that, but again, that goes back to my point, there tend to be issues specific as opposed yeah. to a grand elite True. that give general public, you know, public advice. Right. Yeah. Well, when a, a student comes to Northwestern Law, as they will be next week, and walks into the right. doors of Levy Mayor for the first time, um, and enters the, begins to enter the profession, yeah. Um, it looks a little different than in Wigmore's day, but what are it they going to find? Well, uh, first of all, when they walk through the doors, I, when I first walked through the doors of Northwestern's um, law school um, almost 20 years ago, it was sort of breathtaking given the, just the building. And then knowing that somebody like Wigmore you know, had been such an important uh, leader in the history of, uh, of the law school. And so it's, I think for the new student coming in, it's always, uh, they're starting something new. It's, it's almost intimidating, but it certainly yes. is energizing. Um, Energized exciting, to yeah. do that. It's exciting to do that. You know, I think that the student coming in today does face a very different world. Um, they face a world that's probably far more competitive. Simply getting your law license today um, doesn't necessarily guarantee the status that we talked about or, or, yes. or, or a high income. I mean, you have to have personal characteristics and drive to take advantage of the training you get at a place like Northwestern. Um, to advance uh, to advance your career. They're also going into a world, and this goes back to the status issue, where lawyers are not automatically uh, given the benefit of the doubt um, in Correct. terms of their status within the community. You have to earn it now um, yeah. much more than, than you did you did in the past. So that's another, uh, that's another challenge for them. And the last big thing I see uh, is that the nature of practice today is very different. Uh, and again, it goes back to the deep, what I was calling the deprofessionalization of law. Yes. Um, it used to be that a lawyer uh, could operate as sort of a standalone individual and clients would come to the lawyer who would define right. their problems in strictly legal terms. Now the best lawyers always gave other kinds of advice, but um, what you were asked to do as a technical lawyer was much more narrow than it is today. Uh, our students when they graduate... And it was much more going to court. It was more going to court. It was more court oriented. Right? We have a we have a wonderful uh, interview with Judge Pincham where he yeah. talks about when he first went to work for uh, Hollis Clayton, I think it was. Mm -hmm. He would see clients until four or five in the morning, and they would sit in his waiting room from eight in the evening wow. until four or five in the morning to see him. Wow! Wow! Yeah! Yeah! I you know. But it was about going to court. court These right. are people who, who wanted the appearance. lawyer to go to right. court. And that's just not, I mean, lawyers do so many other things today uh, in terms of the practice. I mean, only probably 70% of lawyers never have their head in a courtroom, never, yes. never appear in a courtroom. Right. You know, some are working on preparing cases, but most of them are doing other things. They're doing real estate transactions. They're doing various kinds of commercial things. They're handling bankruptcies. Uh, right. Uh, they're ha handling family law, matrimonial, and, and, and child issues. Um, so, it's a it's it's less court centric, yes. uh, centered than it used to be. And of course, that makes judges less important in a way. It does, right? It does. Uh, and there's so many now; it's hard for judges to sort of rise above, you know, rise above the pack either. Um, the other thing I was going to say, though, was that the the environment in which our students work is very different. I mean, it, instead of being that, you know, solo practitioner who can make a very good oral argument as well as write a real estate um, deed uh, very effectively, um, they're, they're actually now asked to participate far more in group activity or teams uh, in groups where they are expected to contribute to a final product. Very often their, their customer client is on, has yeah. people on that team. Uh, they have to understand far more about the way the rest of the world works than lawyers really had in the past when they could define their skill as being uh, very autonomous and, and, and narrow uh, in what they do. Oh, I th although I think, as you mentioned, the really good lawyers, I've they always, always had, had right. that perspective. Right. right. And, you know, they've always had that perspective. And um, it's just, you know, it, it's just that the overall world has shifted uh, more and more. They have to have that. Um, and the norms, the, the expectations norms. of the profession yeah. have changed. Yeah, right. So that when you graduate from law school, the person who's hiring you expects from you oh, yeah. that you can do all these other things. Yeah, well, we often, you know, you often hear um, lawyers complain about law schools because um. they don't really train students in practical, um, practical skills. What we find at Northwestern, at least, is that while our employers tend not to, you know, they don't worry about whether or not you can you know, know how to file a particular complaint in a particular jurisdiction, what they do want are people who are not completely clueless 
about what it's all about. And yeah. uh, you know, our students are, are, are particularly good at, at problem solving and figuring out those issues yes. uh, on their own without a lot of tremendous um, uh, guidance. It comes from their maturity and other things. Um, um, and Wigmore would have appreciated that. Oh yeah, no, I, 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 I definitely think so. Now, legal education is very tricky because uh, over time it became um, quite academic. Uh, you know, in part because the faculty who wanted to be more and more academic uh, pushed their students that way. They, they, uh, they often treated their students as, as many graduate students mm -hmm. in, in PhD programs. Right. And uh, that's not, a, you know, I think legal education, and that's where you hear a lot of complaints from, yeah. from the outside about legal education. Uh, I don't think the answer is to simply, you know, have them sit in a law office and, and do all the technical details. Um, we need to do what we do best on a comparative advantage basis. Uh, um, but I do think we and other law schools, but particularly us, have, have tried to push more to get our students out there and more exposure so they do understand maybe not how to file a complaint in the, in the Cook County, but when they're in New York County or, or, or LA or something, yes. they can, uh, they know how to solve those problems and, and figure that out. And they have a sense of a different legal culture so yeah. that they know that New York and Chicago and Tokyo and London yes. are the same places but different places. Yeah. Well, actually that was a, on the international front. That's the, a real emerging trend, which is that there are far more people today at, at any location in the world who practice law pretty much the same use the same conventions, they think about the problems the same way. And again, I think that's driven more by globalization of their, of their clients. But um, uh, when we bring uh, foreign lawyers to Northwestern, what they're really looking to do is become part of that international culture themselves, mm -hmm. likewise our students. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they end up going to Hong Kong or yeah. to Paris or to Bangkok um, or, or wherever it is, yes. Um, there is sort of a common community now of yes. lawyers. I mean, it's not that you're tied to your local jurisdiction anymore. Uh, yeah, that's true. And I think Wigmore would have been very happy with that.